Okay, Joseph loses a game of musical chairs, so now we'll remove a pew. I don't have to sit. I don't have to sit. So we remove a pew and then do it all over again, right? Is that how you, that's how musical chairs goes. I don't know how musical pews go. If we only allowed one person per pew, they would get a lot of people out in the first round. But we're live, so good evening. I think we're live. Live. Good. And welcome this evening. And uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, uh, again, for your goodness to us today. We're thankful for the rain and uh, know that uh, as we've had a dry year for the most part, that the rain is, is uh, needed and appreciated and we're grateful for it. We do pray tonight that we would honor and glorify you. Uh, we think as well of uh, the Middle East and the conflict going on there, and we, we pray for the protection of life. We pray for an end of hostilities there. And uh, Lord, just pray that you would uh, bring about good even out of this uh, conflict. And, and uh, we do pray for the wisdom for uh, politicians and leaders in these countries and, and here in the U.S. as well. Um, Lord, again, as we meet together tonight, pray that we would honor and glorify you. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start off with hymn number 198 tonight. Fun one to sing and an awful one to lead, so I try to go back and forth between giving it to Daniel and making myself lead it. I think you're up next, because this might be two in a row for me. At least that's how it feels, so... Probably wrong. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost, by it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been blown asunder, giving me liberty for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defile, by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace in heaven for all eternity. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty falling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it, greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. It is a wonderful grace. Reaches the most defiled. And the author says, you know how I know that? It reached me. 
uh, over a couple pages, hymn number 201, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Hymn number 201. <clears throat> Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold To the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that is garden and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is a stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And over to the red folders. Anyone know the number? Nine. Nine. Thank you in stereo where available. Like for Nathaniel, that was perfect stereo. Got it from both sides. And only because our hymn book only has the chorus of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And that's a, that's a tragedy. So we got all three verses here. Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. <laughs> soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. 
Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. All right, items tonight for uh, praise prayer. Testimony, Thanksgiving, one we haven't asked for in a while. Anyone want to share a verse that they've memorized recently? You know, so John 3.16 that you memorized 40 years ago doesn't count. Any verses memorized recently that anyone would like to share? Along with praise, prayer, testimony, Thanksgiving. So you got to warn us about this, Pastor. I knew it until you said it. And then it went out the back door. Yeah, Susanna. Ah, yes, very good. Are you doing a lot from First Thessalonians? Is this getting ready for Bible quizzing? What's that? Doing Bible quizzing? <laughs> so you probably know a few more than that, huh? But you like that one, huh? It's a nice one. Susanna just goes, I just have to choose which verse to share. Austin. I was going to say before you got to that, boy, someone was listening during the fourth point this morning of we learned to trust God when we we need to remind ourselves of God's provision. <clears throat> That's the best way when it's reinforcing. It's funny how God's provision varies sometimes. Joseph. So what does that mean about God? All three are the same. The Alpha and Omega, the first and last letter of the alphabet in Greek. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's got it covered. He was there at the beginning and he'll be there at the end. It's mm -hmm. a good verse too. Probably a lot of good verses, huh?
Uh, my dad goes for his second chemo treatment tomorrow, and he wasn't feeling up to 100% yet. And something to know about my dad, I was thinking about it. If he felt anywhere better than 70%, he wouldn't let you know that he wasn't up to 100%. So when my dad says not up to 100%, that's probably on the bottom half of the 100% scale. So he's got a chemo treatment tomorrow, and then I guess for the first 48 hours after chemo, it's very imperative not to be around germs or get sick or infection or all of that. And that might be part of the reason he stayed home today was not feeling the best and not wanting to get germs. Also, we found out um, Dory messaged this afternoon that Jet has spots. Spots in his throat and a fever. So, right. Pray that he gets better and it doesn't go through the whole family and that seems to be going around this year, so. And watch out when Austin prays for God to meet for a need because his manage, uh, another manager got COVID. <laughs> it was just the way you said it. And the manager got COVID and, um, yeah, but it was the provision of the overtime Funny how resistant we can be to some of God's answers sometimes. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I guess this is meeting a need I, I prayed for. <clears throat> Jeremiah has midterm starting tomorrow. Uh, so midterms all this week. Apparently he's been looking forward to midterm week because there's no homework to do. So I don't know if he enjoys tests that much. Newsflash, as homeschoolers, we didn't rely very much on tests, so hopefully he's had a few of them this semester that he's gotten used to what they're like, huh? Any other items for prayer or praise tonight? nice to all of us as we are. And it's good having Al here. He gave me a hard time because last week I said, you know, shocking the new people or the, the visitor. I used the word visitor when I meant someone new that hadn't been around, you know, to hear how we shout aloud Hosanna when we sing Sound the Battle Cry or what was the song? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. There was something else last week in particular, wasn't there? Maybe not. We're, we're odd around here. <laughs> by, by we, I mean mostly me, but it's okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we are thankful uh, for your provision to meet needs. Um, many times we, we think we know how you're going to meet needs, and we're grateful that you're not limited to by what we can see or what we can imagine. And we're grateful for that. We do continue to pray for some of the needs before us. We think of my dad with his chemo treatment tomorrow. Uh, we think of my father-in-law with his uh, doctor's visits and, and uh, even some of the problems they found that aren't going to get resolved for a couple of months yet. And, and uh, we pray for health and strength for them. Uh, we think uh, of Jeremiah with his midterms this week and, and pray for wisdom for him and, and to be able to remember the things that he's learned and studied and and uh, that he would be able to do well on those as he continues to learn to uh, looking to uh, serve you in ministry and pray that you would prepare him well through the school there. Uh, we do think of Jet tonight as, as uh, he's got a fever and, and uh, some spots in his throat. We pray that he would heal up quickly and uh, that that illness would not spread to, to others in the house and, and uh, that you would uh, give health and strength there. Uh, Lord, we are thankful for the ways that you meet our needs and, and uh, the ways that you lead us and guide us and direct us. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, as we see how you lead and direct, that you would help us to keep our hearts open to those that you would uh, lead us and direct us to and to the things that you would call us to do as well. And, and uh, pray that uh, 
you would find receptive hearts uh, as you you uh, call and and lead in our lives. Father, we're thankful for your word and the encouragement it can be to us for the uh, verses that were shared tonight. We're grateful for those that are, are memorizing your word and, and uh, we know that it, it does not return void, but it always accomplishes what you send it to do. And uh, we do pray, uh, continue to pray for Israel and uh, for those in Gaza. Uh, Lord, we, we uh, desire to see a uh, an end to the loss of life and the tragedies that uh, we've seen on the news and and uh, the headlines and, and know that for those living it over there it's it's been a heartbreaking week and uh, very difficult in so many ways so we pray for wisdom we pray for protection of life and and we pray for an end of hostilities there and and uh, yet we understand from your word that that's not going to happen completely until you come back but um, Lord we do pray for for uh, peace and and uh, pray that uh, they would be able to uh, lay down their weapons and and uh, be able to live in safety and peace the way we enjoy even here in the states. Again, Father, we're thankful for this time we can gather and we ask your blessing on our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Psalm chapter twenty-eight tonight. One thing about the Psalms when I always when I considered going through the Psalms, I think there's no way I could hit every single Psalm because some of them are repetitive. They just sound like other ones and they're so close. And, and how many times can you preach on a Psalm that, that is just a, a praise Psalm? Or how many times can you preach on a Psalm that is, David was in trouble, he was facing his enemies, he was scared, he cried out to God and God answered him and he trusted in God. And, and a lot of the Psalms go that way. But then I realized, you know, as, as I go through, and now uh, I'd say we're 28 weeks in, but I know we missed a couple weeks in there, that we're probably 30 or 32 weeks into being in the Psalms, um, that God did not make a mistake when he put 150 Psalms in the book of Psalms. Just like as we look at our, our hymn book, our, our hymn book is not inspired like the Psalter in the Bible, but, you know, we've got 600 so, uh, songs in there. Like, well, some of them are a little bit repetitive. Well, that's good. And uh, especially when they're inspired by God, the repetition is good. The challenges are good. And here in Psalm 28, the title tonight, Grace Not According to My Deeds. I remember growing up in there was always, well, the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is grace. And I don't know if that was just very popular back as I was growing up. I think I heard some of the same in Bible college and in seminary, you know, Old Testament law, New Testament grace. Yes, it's the same God, but he's acting differently. But it's interesting when we re recognize that it's the same God in the Old Testament as the New Testament. And we look for God's grace in the Old Testament. It's all over the place. I guess for years, I was told, well, that's the law. And there was, man, I'd hate to live under the law because there was no grace back then. Well, I think that's a bad perspective for a Christian to have. Even to say, well, I wouldn't want to have to live under the law. Well, no one would want to live under the law. But even in the Old Testament times, the Israelites, the Jewish people, lived under God's grace in the dispensation of the law. Yes, they had rules that they had to follow, but yes, they broke those rules because they couldn't keep the law. And yes, they were dependent on God's grace just like we are. So grace, not according to my deeds. Uh, Psalm 28, beginning in verse 1, David says, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down to the pit. Hear my voice, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands towards thy holy oracle. Calling out to God gives us hope. It's easy to be hopeless. It's easy to look at the world around us and I hear people say all the time, you know, well, these are the darkest times. It can't be very long until Christ comes again. And uh, we were talking to Mary Lou this week, and she said, Pastor, I remember something you said, and it still comes back to me. God hasn't flooded the earth, and it must have been really bad in the days of Noah, and it must have been really bad in Sodom and Gomorrah 
that God hasn't destroyed the world today as well on one hand he promised he wouldn't destroy it with flood again he's going to destroy it with fire at the end of all time but that doesn't mean that his toolbox is empty as far as the judgment that he could bring and sometimes people say it's it's as bad as it's ever been and and so it, it can't Jesus can't be delaying much longer in his coming back Well, people with that perspective kind of have a hopeless perspective. There's nothing God can do other than come back and judge. That's a very hopeless perspective. It means the only hope we have in, is in his second coming. But we have a lot of hope even before he comes again. A friend shared this week, he goes, I think a lot of evangelical Christians have a very bad view of what's going on in Israel. And the the bottom line was, I see a lot of evangelicals getting excited that there's war in Israel and Gaza because they think that's the end time events playing out and that must mean Christ is about to come back. And I said, well, I guess I'm glad I don't know Christians like that. I, I don't know anyone that said, yippee, Israel's under attack. Or yippee, God's going to have to intervene soon. I, I don't know anyone that's giddy about this. It's probably a good thing. But if that's where a believer finds themselves, then they have no hope. They are hopeless in this world. But calling out to God gives hope. That situation in the Middle East right now is not beyond God's control. God's not up in heaven going, well, I guess, I guess at this point, I just have to send my son. Let's, let's start working through the, the, uh, the end time events in Revelation. Because if God was in that situation, back in 1967, he wouldn't have had any other options either. The, uh, was it three-day war, five-day war, three-day war? Six-day war. That, that's probably the one, yes. I knew it was some number, and I'm normally good with the numbers. How many times has Israel been attacked even during our lifetimes? Several times. If every time Israel is attacked, God has no other options but to send his son, he would have sent his son a very, 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 very long time ago. But calling out to God gives hope. David says, I will cry to thee, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down to the pit. Those that go down to the pit are those that are hopeless. And David said, God, I cry out to you because I know in crying out to you, I won't become like those that go down to the pit. And David's hope was that he wasn't headed down to the pit like those that didn't trust in God. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean David thought he was better than everyone else? That David thought he was better than the Philistines? Better than, than the other enemies of, of Israel? the Assyrians, the Babylonians that would be coming, that he was better than, than all of those that were around him? If that was his hope, he would have cried out and said, Oh God, I've kept your law. I'm okay. Therefore, you need to reward me. David doesn't do that. David cries out to God, which means David's hope wasn't in his own goodness. And David's hope, if his hope wasn't in his own goodness, and the Bible tells us David was a man after God's own heart, I certainly think that we shouldn't expect that it's our own goodness that makes God take notice of us. Calling out to God gives hope. He knew it wasn't of his own goodness. In verse 3, David says, Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds, according to the wickedness of their enemies, endeavors. Give them after the works of their hands. Render to them their desert. Now, you think desert. Um, I like dessert. We had cookies for lunch. We had apple crisp last night for dinner. That was dessert like two meals in a row that you can have because you can't have dessert for breakfast can you if you have a cinnamon roll with breakfast it's not really dessert but it does no, 
Give them their dessert, which is coming. It's it's the root word that we get deserve from. So it's not your just desserts after a meal. It's your dessert, what you deserve. David says, give them what they deserve. And uh, because they regard not, verse 5, the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. It's the old English got you there. The wicked receive according to their deeds. And David says, don't catch me up with them. Don't draw me away with the wicked who get what they deserve. David says, I don't want to get what I deserve. I don't want to get my dessert. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Toby's thinking, I want to get my dessert after a meal. But I don't want to get my dessert what I deserve. You could get a desert, though. David didn't want to be drawn away with them. He said, don't lump me in with them. Because God's got two different rules for judgment. And David understood that. The two different rules we know for judgment is he separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep, the, the ones that believe in him, the ones that trust in him, they're under the blood of Jesus Christ. They have forgiveness of sins, are not judged according to their works. There's the great white throne judgment, which is the, or the Bema seat judgment, which is a judgment of rewards. But then those that don't trust in Christ are judged according to their works. David says, don't get me confused with the unsaved, would be the terminology we would use. When he said wicked, he doesn't mean wicked because of the bad things they do. He means wicked as those that don't trust in you. And we can see that in verse 5, because David says, give the wicked according to their deeds, because they regard not the works of the Lord. He doesn't say judge them according to their deeds, because their deeds are awful. David understood the heart of man is awful. The wicked receive according to their deeds, and David didn't want to be drawn away with them. They would get what they deserve. They would get according to their deeds, but grace means we don't get according to our deeds. I guess great, actually that's mercy, not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. But they kind of tie together as uh, we look at God giving us grace and mercy. But they receive according to their deeds, not because their deeds are so awful, but because they don't regard the works of the Lord. What would it mean to regard the works of the Lord? To pay attention to what God does? Because they don't regard the operation of his hands? Because they don't call upon God the way David started out this psalm. David says, Unto thee, O Lord, will I cry. That's what separated him from the wicked. He cried out to God. So, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible tells me that. All the way from the beginning of the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 4, and there's lots of other places we can go to this, but Genesis chapter 4 and verse 26, in a genealogy kind of, sort of, God tells us, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. In Old Testament times, began to call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, it's got to be different in Romans than it was in Genesis, right? the calling upon the name of the Lord, because they didn't know about Jesus dying on the cross. And in Romans, Paul's talking all about Jesus dying on the cross. But the key fact is that they called upon the name of the Lord. And when we read that in Genesis, that's when people began to depend on God. Sin had entered the world. Sin was multiplying. But people began to call upon the name of the Lord. In Romans, Paul is encouraging 
for people to call upon the name of the Lord. Not because, well, if you do enough good, that'll outweigh your bad. But because our only hope is in calling upon the name of the Lord. The wicked receive according to their deeds. What makes a person wicked? Not calling on the name of the Lord. Not asking forgiveness. Not looking to God and looking to follow him. And call upon the name of the Lord obviously implies that we're going to follow him or seek to follow him. We're going to seek to do what he desires, what he wants. Because the wicked, they don't regard the works of God. They don't regard the works of his hand. They don't honor him. They don't call out to him. Those who trust God don't get according to their deeds, don't get according to their works. The last uh, four verses of the, cha of the chapter, we find out that those who trust God see his blessings. Now, there are certain blessings that come to everybody. When it rains, it doesn't just rain on the unjust and it doesn't just rain on the just. You say, say well, is rain a good thing or a bad thing? I suppose it depends on who you ask. You ask the farmer, is rain a good thing? And he says, oh, that's a good thing. You ask a farmer who's got to get his hay in from the fields, is rain a good thing? He'll say, yeah, but not today. <laughs> yes, runner, is rain a good thing or a bad thing? I think it depends on the runner. But I saw some today that were participating in a 5K somewhere or something like that, and they said, we made the best of the weather. I have a friend out in Chicago area that anytime it rains during a sports event, like yesterday, I think he was watching his kids cross country, and there was some other sporting event that was outside and uh, he was complaining about the rain. So he said, well, is rain a good thing or a bad thing? If it's a good thing, then it should only fall on the just. And if it's a bad thing, it should only fall on the wicked. But you know what? God sends the rain on the wicked and the, the righteous for good or for bad. He'll rain on a church picnic. And there are times that the righteous field does not get rain, even as the wicked field does not get rain. But we see at the end of the chapter that those who trust in the Lord see God's blessing. Verse 6, David says, he realized he's just called upon the Lord and say, don't be silent. And he says in verse 6, blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. It's a great way to pray. You know, when you pray and you call out to God, to tell God to finish your prayer with I know you've heard me. And, and not just, I know you've heard me, so you better do something. God, I know you've heard me, and I know you're going to respond with what's best for me, because that's trusting God. That's resting in him. Sometimes I think when we pray, we, we, we hope God will do what we've asked. We hope God will be good. We hope because we struggle with the trust issue sometimes. We, it's hard for us to trust someone else, even when that someone else is God. But David says, blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. God's heard me. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. Some of God's blessings that David saw, he said, he has been my help and my defense. Now sometimes as we look at these Psalms, we see that David starts out in trouble and he finishes with praise. And we think, well, maybe David started penning the Psalm at one time and he finished penning the Psalm after the, the answer was had. Or maybe he penned the whole Psalm after the, the problem and the answer were resolved and he just kind of put them together. I think that may have happened sometimes. But I also think David may have written some of the Psalms when he was still in trouble because he knew what the answer would be. That he, he wrote the Psalm saying, he heard my supplications while he was still praying and the enemy was still there because there's that trust. David says, my heart trusted in him and I am helped. Maybe David was in the midst of one trouble and looked back at another trouble and said, when I cried out to God, he answered, and I've cried out to God for this. I know he's going to answer again. But those who trust in the Lord see his blessing, his help, and his defense. 
David says, because of that, I will praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Another blessing that David says those that trust in God will see is his salvation. Now, for David, there was several aspects to that salvation. There's the salvation of he knew he was not going to go down to the pit. He knew he was not going to get judged according to his deeds. He was going to receive God's grace and God's mercy. But David also saw God's salvation from enemies that were round about him. How many times was David saved from Saul's attacks? You would, you would think, kind of reading the story, how many different ways can Saul attack David? How many times can Saul track David down in the wilderness and David escape? How many ways can Saul hurl a javelin at David and he escape? Kind of like watching the old Batman reruns or something and say, how many times can Batman get out of trouble? How many times can he be loaded onto a conveyor belt heading towards a buzzsaw? There's probably only one episode, but that's one that sticks out in my mind. God is the strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Those who trust in him will see his salvation. Now, does that mean God is going to remove every difficulty that we face in life? Obviously not. I mean, if he removed every difficulty, any Christian shouldn't need eyeglasses, right? Because that's a difficulty he should save me from. It's, it's so much better when you can see without lenses that get all dirty. I made the mistake of uh, making french fries this afternoon. I switched to my normal everyday glasses instead of my church glasses. I didn't switch back to my church glasses. I need salvation from my bad vision. God doesn't save us from every difficulty. He doesn't save us from every difficult circumstance. James tells us some of the reason why he doesn't. Because the trial of our faith works patience, and let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. In looking at Exodus 16 this morning, God's provision for his people, without the need being evident to God's people, there was no need for them to trust him. So, does God save us from every struggle? No, but he is our salvation. Our salvation eternally from hell and saved to heaven, but also our salvation that even in difficulty, we know that he has the answer, and in the difficulty, he is using it for our good. Verse 9, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. Again, we have the salvation of God there, but also the blessing and the feeding. Those who trust in God see his blessing and see his provision. Sometimes we might listen to stories of how God provides. You might read missionary stories of how God provided for people on the field or or see a missionary's post on Facebook that they prayed for this need and God provided, uh, we need a vehicle while we're back in the States and God provides them with a, a $30,000 vehicle for them to use free of charge for the year while they're back. And you think, well, why can't God provide like that for me? You ever have that problem? Looking at other people's blessing and wondering why you don't have it? Sometimes we might have to understand there's a couple reasons why we might not have the same blessing as the missionary coming home on furlough, or whoever else saw a blessing. Sometimes um, it's because we don't have as great of a need as those receiving those blessings. Sometimes when we deal with the missionaries, some that we might even support on the field, we might, might say, well, how come they get a blessing? You know, Joanne Tompkins, she's had so much help from her church down there in Tennessee, building her retirement home while she's over in, in Africa serving the Lord. How come she gets all that? Well, there's a greater need there. The missionary family coming home on furlough provided with a vehicle. That's one small cushion of their life that they have for that year of furlough. 
we have friends that just went back to Akike, Chile. And uh, with Facebook, you get to keep up with things. Well, now we're living here. We've just moved in here for the last week of our furlough, and we're trying to get everything together and weigh out our luggage and make sure that each suitcase isn't over. And missionaries kind of shuffle things, especially the families, shuffle things between suitcases to try to fit in as much as they can without them being overweight and paying overweight on the multiple flights they have to go back. And the missionary family's kids all have to say goodbye to friends that they've known for the year, to go back to friends that they knew a year ago. And we even heard from uh, Eva this week that she was struggling a little bit that her parents went back to Chile because for this past year she got to see them more often because they're around. Like, well, why does a missionary get a big blessing? Well, one reason might be there's a greater need, and another reason might be because they asked. James tells us you have not because you ask not. You want to see God meet needs in your life? Ask. He is our blessing and our provision for those that trust in him. David says, feed them also and lift them up forever. He knew God would meet their needs because those who trust in the Lord see God's blessing. God's grace, even in the Old Testament, not according to our deeds. David understood that, and we can get that as well when we call upon the name of the Lord, when we rest in him, when we look to him. There's no words. Oh, good, you saw that. We're going to close with hymn number 91. I noticed we did not have slides made up for this one yet. But it's very repetitive, so for those online, once you hear the first thing, if you want to sing along at home, uh, it's the first four syllables repeated over and over again throughout the, the verse. So it's Alleluia, he's my Savior, he is worthy, and I will praise him. You now know all the words of the psalm. Why don't you stand with me and we'll sing all four verses together. Hymn number 91. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. He's my Savior, He's my Savior. 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 He is worthy, He is worthy. He is worthy, He is worthy. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. I will praise him, 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 I will praise him. I will praise Him, I will praise Him. Father, there's no other response for the believer to your grace and to your mercy than to praise and to worship. And we are grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your grace. We're grateful that as we put our trust in you that we do not receive according to our deeds. There are times that we like to talk ourselves into thinking that we're we're better than others and that's why we're heading to heaven or that we've got things under control or that we're we're doing well and, and as far as keeping your law and keeping your commands but lord if david a man after your own heart realized that he didn't want to receive according to his deeds we have to understand that that we shouldn't want to receive after our deeds as well and it's only by your grace by your love and by your mercy and we're grateful to have all of those things in, in great supply. Pray, Father, that as David, that we would call upon your name. Whether it's a small need, whether it's a small bump in the road, 
whether it's a bigger need, that we would call upon your name and look to your provision. Because as David pointed out, those that trust in the Lord see his blessings. And Father, we pray that we would give you the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.